So I want to start today with some stories from the newspapers, set a tone. Uh, Tehran, it was over the last few years. Tehran. One afternoon, Fatima Eskandari opened the front metal gate of the shelter she runs for runaway girls in central Tehran and was confronted with two men armed with knives and rifles. Who are you? she asked. We are the uncles of a girl named Ranach. We are told that you are keeping Ranach. And indeed, that's true. Ranach was 16 years old and she was inside recovering from the bruises that she suffered at the hands of these same uncles. She had run away from home to escape them. The uncles had driven from Sanandai in the northwest corner of Iran, hundreds of miles away. They demanded to see their niece. The uncles said she had shamed the family by leaving home a few days before. They had come to behead her. They were very open about this. There was no secret. Staten Island, New York. A 17-year-old girl worked as a cashier in a convenience store. The store owner said that the girl was stealing from the register and he was going to fire her. The girl went to her father and said that the store owner had groped her. The father flew into a rage, grabbed a baseball bat and a gun, went down to the store and killed two people. Islamabad, Pakistan. Zahida Parveen, 21 years old, was pregnant in 1998 when her husband, Mahmoud Iqbal, bound her hands and feet with a rope. First he shoved a rod in one of her eyes, blinding her, then cut off her nose and ears. He suspected her of seeing another man. Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Felicia Scott already had two sons, but she had an obsessive desire to have another baby. She convinced her boyfriend to help her get one, so they went out shot a pregnant woman and cut the full-term fetus from her womb. Saudi Arabia, New York Times. A young woman was raped by seven men. She pressed charges. The Saudi court sentenced her to 200 lashes. 200 lashes is almost a lethal dose. Dominican Republic. Crusita Mendina is 18. She's been married for a year in which her husband, Jose, beat her constantly. She had the courage to separate from him, but she met with Jose after their separation when he asked her to talk. He took her to a desolate street on his motorcycle and they had an argument. He grabbed a container he had filled with what they called the devil's acid, a mixture of gasoline, hydrochloric acid, car battery, car battery acid, urine and other chemicals. He threw it at Crusita. The liquid disfigured her permanently. It burned her face, her arms, the right side of her chest, and a portion of her legs. She's still trying to bring her ex-husband to justice. Gosaragaon, Bangladesh. I'm almost done with this. <laughs> the village elders met, met under a lychee tree to put a value on Payara Begum's grotesquely ruined face. A young man had become obsessed with her, but she was married and he was turned away. He took his revenge with sulfuric acid to erase the beauty that had once enchanted him and to empty her life of happiness. Her cheeks melted, her right eye was bl blinded and hollowed to a crater. The husband had to bribe the prosecutors before they would even take up the case. Eventually, the perpetrator's family had to pay a fee of $3,000. In one year, the, number, the year I have statistics for, 1999, there are 174 acid attacks in Bangladesh. And those are the ones that were officially reported. Of course, probably the vast majority of these never get reported. The article mentioned a 13-year-old girl who was attacked as she slept. Some victims die. Some are forced to marry their attacker. Another was forbidden to come home until she allowed her husband to take a second wife. Well, these stories are obviously uh, at the extreme of human behavior. But the purpose of, of giving you all that is to explain that human sexual behavior has extremely deep roots, very emotional, uh, and very hard to, to change or manipulate. Male-female relationships are very difficult for humans uh, to cope with. And I think it shouldn't particularly surprise you that <coughs> human sexuality is not particularly driven by rational calculation. 
the few, the few stories that I've pulled out of the newspapers uh, are just the tip, clearly just the tip of an iceberg of a very widespread ph phenomenon. In the long course of human history, across cultures you see the, art, the gave you everything from Brooklyn to Bangladesh, uh, these very similar sorts of things happen. Uh, females, through the long course of history and in most cultures where most humans have lived, uh, females are treated very badly. There's a huge amount of battering. Battering is the prime human version of, of violence. <coughs> and females are so discriminated against that statistics indicate that there's something now, right now, something like a hundred million missing females. That these females are either aborted uh, before they're born, killed by infanticide uh, pretty much as soon as they're born, or neglected so that they don't get the food or they don't get the medical care that their brothers get. So there's a, a dearth of something like a hundred million women in the world today. And uh, so these are not these are these are extreme incidents, but it's an extremely common uh, thing. And one of the purposes of this course is to try to get you to understand what what is causing all of this. From a biological point of view, uh, this abuse of females is, is extremely weird. Uh, males, as you know, can only reproduce via a female, and so and evolution is the name of the game is reproducing. So almost all species, what kind of a female do the males want? They want the healthiest, most well-protected, the best-fed female, and you'll see some examples of the extremes to which males will go to, to provide this, so that that female can produce offspring for that male and carry on the evolution game. But in humans, we find that it's very general that females are treated atrociously, and it just doesn't make sense that that human males should keep many of their females hungry, sick, and, and abused. And in childbirth, if a woman does give birth to a child, they can often be underweight, uh, sickly, and so forth, because the mother is not in great health. So this is all a biological disaster, the way human males treat uh, human females. And uh, we don't know why, I mean, we do. We have some idea why humans do that, and the first part of the course will talk something about that. That's on the individual level, and evolution works on an individual level, but if you think on a species level, uh, missing a hundred million of your, of your breeders, that does not sound like a great uh, tactic for survival of the species. So I spent some time when I started getting interested in this whole topic, uh, reading uh, the anthropological literature, the sociological literature, the feminist literature, and basically I thought all those explanations were a crock. <laughs> and I don't think they came close to, to answer. So in my own uh, studies, I had to go back to the very beginning uh, and understand what sex was really all about. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you a few important things about sex and reproduction. The first one is that reproduction turns out to be very difficult. So one day, I was sitting over in the, our botanical garden under one beautiful big oak, huge oak tree that they have, and the ground was kind of just covered with acorns. Uh, under this tree. And uh, I asked one of the forestry people, because that's the kind of things that they know, I asked them, how many acorns has this tree produced? And they said, well, the, when the spread is so much and it's this high and, you know, and it's so deep. And they came up with probably 750,000 acorns a year. I thought, wow. <laughs> so I checked the literature and uh, found that uh, people that collect these nuts for commercial purposes, a good oak tree can produce 500 pounds of acorns a year. And many sources say that an oak tree produces millions of acorns in its lifetime. Wow, a lot of reproduction, right? Got to be sex before it. And then I asked myself, how many of these million acorns survive to make a tree like their parents? What's the answer? think basic biology, of course, you might know that. Well, what if each tree, on average, taking an average of trees, made two acorns? How many acorns would there be? How many oak trees would there be in the next? Made two acorns that made trees. How many oak trees would there be in the next generation? Twice as many as now. What if they only did? And so 
that can't continue because then the earth would immediately fill up with oak trees and we'd be you know, this deep in, in acorns. And similarly, if, they if the trees produce less, on average, less than one, what will happen to the oak species? Goes extinct. So over the long time, on average, each oak tree has only one acorn that grows up to be a, 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 an acorn-producing tree <coughs> itself. That's an amazing reduction. It puts out millions of acorns that only one survives. And of course, this is true not only uh, for, for trees, but uh, fish, which spew out, you know, fish females, huge numbers, hundreds, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of eggs, or, or males of many, many species that spew out billions of sperms, that in a sexual species, the way animals are, two parents, on average, two children. If two parents for a species average more than two children, the world fills up with squirrels or whatever animal we're talking about. If they have less than two over a long run, they've gone extinct. Most species, in fact, in the history have gone extinct. So the average of current species has got to be one for one or two for two, depending on how you count. But for most species, it's less than, less than that, because most species have gone extinct. So the answer is, it is brutally difficult uh, to reproduce. Um, if any given individual in a species produces a lot of children, more than one or two, depending on how you're counting, uh, then that means that some other individuals are having less. Again, unless the species are humans, which are about the only species that are increasing continuously o o over the long time. <coughs> As an example, they now, by this genetic testing, have tested how many descendants does Genghis Khan have? And the answer is 16 million descendants, <laughs> this one guy. So that's an awful lot. But guess how he did it? By killing a lot of men and raping their women. So he, he has that many descendants because an awful lot of men, all the men he killed, don't have any descendants. And that's just Genghis Khan. The Mongol horde had a lot of males. And I think they spread their seeds quite widely. And a lot of males and conquered people just didn't, didn't survive. So, and of course, every army in the world uh, has done, well, essentially all, have done a huge amount of raping, and it's a wonderful instrument of gene flow in the human uh, population. So, because reproduction is actually so difficult, species have evolved all kinds of fantastic mechanisms uh, for trying to be successful at reproduction. <clears throat> so that's point one. Point two is that sex is not fair. It's not only difficult, but it's not fair. So sex goes way back in evolution. And even bacteria do it. So <laughs> this is, <laughs> the biologists here are laughing. This is uh, the bacteria that are in your colon. And they have sex in this manner. And so right now, billions of sexual acts are taking place. <laughs> in your unspeakable parts, and this is the way they do it. <laughs> now, I have to go back a little bit. <clears throat> in something like this, actually, can the, the, the exchange of DNA can be either way, and this is, even though the hairy guy on the left is producing that long pilus, as it's called, uh, there's more or less equality of sexuality uh, here. But when it comes to higher organisms, you get quite a different story. You all know the story of the chicken and the egg. Well, the way I tell it is the poor chicken. The chicken has to uh, build this big egg, has to eat like crazy, put all that protein and, and fat into the egg, which are, if you're not fed in the barnyard, which are hard to come by. And then once the chicken is hatched, guess who sits, when the egg comes out, guess who sits on the egg, the female? Guess who protects the young? The female. So that's chickens. You can go all the way up to humans, Females have to spend nine months pregnant, and then in most societies and most times, uh, females are the ones that have the burden of responsibility uh, for the children. Meanwhile, in all this, uh, males just produce a little speck of protoplasm, uh, insert it into the female, say bye-bye, I've had my quickie and I'm off. And not in all species, but in most uh, species, the male has a very minimal part in reproduction, and the female has uh, this huge uh, burden. 
Now, why does that come about? You think evolution would, would require that females just wouldn't play this game in evolution and they would require a more equal distribution of the labor. Well, it turns out it is, uh, starts as a division of labor. So, the first animals to evolve, uh, first of anything, were probably, were almost certainly in the sea and stuck down on the bottom or floating uh, around, and so they couldn't move. And so how do you mate if you can't get up and find your mate? Well, you just spew out your sperms into the ocean, you spew out your eggs into the ocean, and you hope that they meet. Not a very, not a very efficient mechanism. But at that stage, uh, the male has produced zillions of sperms and the female has to produce zillions of eggs. If you're an animal and you have to produce so many of anything, in, of gametes in this case, each one is going to be very tiny. If two tiny things meet and fuse, you've still got a tiny thing. And the odds of survival of a tiny thing are not very great. So evolution doesn't like that idea of the male and the female both spewing out lots and lots of these tiny gametes. So what happens eventually is that the two sexes separate, that the female's job is to make a big enough egg with enough nutrient in it so that the organism can survive, and the male's job is to go find that egg. And so what do males have sperm? What do the sperms evolve? Tails to take them swimming, right? And, as, and they find their job is to find the egg, and so there still has to be lots of those, and they have to expend a lot of energy uh, swimming. So it's still an equal view amount of, of investment. But then the whole animal, once evolution proceeds, the whole animal can now get up and walk over and find a female, or vice versa, and now they can copulate or do some sort of insemination very close together. This now does not require zillions and zillions of sperms. So he, it, if, you're, if, you're, if the eggs, say, are ready laid like a fish in a nest, the male just lays the sperms right on top of the eggs, and he needs some surplus over the number of eggs, but nothing to compensate uh, for the amount of energy she's putting into her eggs. So you start getting an inequality. As soon as animals can find each other and mate in a more spatially enclosed way, then uh, you start getting inequality. So, Evolution goes down that path because it's turned out to be a very, very effective path, and what you get is that females make a few eggs. Her eggs are very expensive. They are expensive and rare. Males still make many, many sperms. His sperms are uh, plentiful and cheap. So this is a, what we call a sexual dimorphism, that males and females are taking different evolutionary routes. And once they take different evolutionary routes, uh, then different reproductive strategies come into play for males and females. <coughs> so a male through the first billion years of evolution has been producing a lot of sperm, and now all of a sudden he figures out how to swim over to a female, and he doesn't need all those sperms, but he's still, evolution is conservative, it's still, he's still producing all these sperms. What is evolution going to do with all those sperms? Well, one thing they can do is he can evolve backwards and just make fewer sperm. That would save him some energy, it would be good for him a little bit, but it wouldn't really get him an awful lot more children, which is the name of the evolution game. Now what he can do with those excess sperms, find another female. That his limit, there, there stops being a limit on the number of females that he can inseminate, he spreads his sperm to as many females as he can find. So. This dimorphism, that sperm are cheap and plentiful while eggs are expensive and rare, leads to different strategies of reproduction in males and females. It also sets up some odd situations where, for instance, males are expendable. Because if one male can fertilize a lot of females, females don't need a lot of males around. And so, for instance, there's a certain uh, female wasp that lays its egg in a caterpillar. Cater wasps are one of the major predators of caterpillar. They lay the egg in. The egg hatches and starts eating up uh, the caterpillar. So, but all of the eggs that are laid in a single caterpillar compete with each other for the food uh, that is the, the caterpillar. So what happens is, 
evolution has arranged it that the females hatch first and they eat up all their brothers except one. And then that one male can fertilize all his sisters and, and things go on. Uh, so the males are expendable in that case. And if the, the females just ignored them and let them alive, the males would be competing with the females for food. The females would grow less big and healthy and they would have less eggs and evolution uh, doesn't like that kind of a system. So uh, we'll, all of these things, if you think it's not very difficult to find uh, human examples of this. Uh, who goes off to war and gets killed? Males. And very often you don't find any reproductive, any change in rate. The females manage to get inseminated human, in humans. So in lots and lots of species, the number of males is really not a critical factor in the amount of reproduction that goes on. So males can inseminate many females, but females want to worry about the survival of each egg. And uh, similarly, again, this is pretty obvious uh, in humans, that a female, if she gets pregnant, uh, is going to be spending nine months pregnant and then breastfeeds and won't get pregnant again. So it's at least a year and probably at least a year and a half before that female can get pregnant again. And we almost always bear only one child with an occasional twin or so forth. So a very low rate of reproduction where a male doesn't have any uh, such kind of limit. And this does not mean that females are monogamous because there's many other reasons why a female might want to have many mates. First of all, we'll see she might want to get resources from many males. You'll see she sometimes will not mate with a, with a, with a male unless that male uh, gives her some resource. She might want to mate with a variety of males because she can't tell which one has the best genes. She may want to mate with many males if her environment is unpredictable and even if she can tell something about his genes, she doesn't know what the environment for her children are going to be like. So she wants to shake up the deck and try to uh, have a variety of children with a variety of different genes. She might want each male to think that he's the father of the children so that he, doesn't, that he protects and doesn't kill the children. There are species who do that. Uh, there's a thing called sperm competition where she may want to have a whole variety of different sperms from different males in her and then the, the sperms compete. So even though this sort of uh, comic book presentation says, oh, males are promiscuous and males want to go around and, and have a lot of sex and females want one, uh, there's many species with many reasons why a female may also want to be promiscuous. It used to be believed that many species were in fact monogamous. Some <coughs> birds produce a very, uh, very good example. What you observe is that a male and a female meet at the beginning of mating season. They stay together all mating season. She maybe sits on the eggs and he brings worms or some combination thereof. And people thought, well, this is great. This is monogamy and what wonderful animals uh, they are. But now we can do DNA testing. <laughs> and it ain't, ain't so. <laughs> that apparently, uh, so they call that now social monogamy and distinguish it from sexual monogamy. And apparently, while social monogamy is as we've always believed it to be, uh, sexual monogamy is almost non-existent. Uh, in species, when they measure it, it turns out 10 to 70 percent of the progeny have been sired by someone other than what they call the resident male. And one article I, I read claimed that there's only one species where it is known for sure that they're 100 percent uh, sexually monogamous. In that case, the male and the female physically fuse together. <laughs> so neither can go anywhere. <laughs> okay, so males, so, so males have the job of finding ac and gaining access uh, to females. And they have, two strat they have basically two strategies. One is uh, to let their sperms compete. In that case, they make just more and better uh, sperm. And the, social, the, the, the sexual system in, in a species like that will be promiscuous, that the females will mate with many males, they'll have a lot of uh, semen in their uh, vagina or spermatheca or whatever, sac for this, and then the, the sperms will compete with each other. And some scientists believe that in humans also, we have a variety of sperm, including killer sperm, 
and other kinds of sperm that, that go in and facilitate this fight. These killer sperm are supposed to kill sperm that have a different uh, genotype. And it's very controversial about whether this, this is true or not. The, the it data starts with when you look at sperm, they have very, uh, human sperm, they have very different shapes. And one version is, well, all these other shapes are just damaged, they're just bad, you know, they're not effective. And there's some evidence for that. And the other story is that, no, these are doing different jobs than, than, than fertilization. And uh, it's a hot area uh, of research. <coughs> so that's strategy number one, to engage in sperm competition. And you'll see if we get time that in uh, our related species, uh, bonobos, uh, well, chimps, our, our, our group of species generally engages in sperm competition. And what you get is very large testes. So you, you can determine this by taking the measure, the, the weight of testes as a fraction of total body weight. And if it's very large, you know there's sperm competition going on. The other strategy, of course, is males can compete with each other for control of the females. And this happens, of course, in modal, motile animals. Uh, a sperm competition is the original thing where you spew out zillions of sperms and then the best ones find, uh, are the ones that find the females. <coughs> but once they're modal, the males can come into contact with each other and they can fight in some way uh, and say control a territory, for instance. So a coral reef fish control territories in the coral and the females cruise around, find a male's got a good territory, then come uh, and mate with them. Well, generally the males will actually fight with each other uh, for dominance and then use that dominance to gain access to females. So how does this, what are some examples of how this all works out? Uh, the females have also two basic strategies. Uh, one is to get the males to provide uh, resources other than, than sperm. And those resources allow her to build big, uh, healthy, eggs. <clears throat> and one of the really cute examples of this is in the jungle, uh, uh, protein, nitrogen, is very, very scarce. The, the soils are thin and, and the rains wash everything away, so it's really hard to get nitrogen. Guess what's a great source of, of nitrogen? Dung. Any animal takes a dump in the rainforest, immediately there's all kinds of especially insects that come and are going to utilize uh, that nitrogen. It's a really scarce resource. <clears throat> so beetles have, are ones that are, that are very good at this, and there's a whole group of beetles called dung beetles. And what do they do? They, as soon as they detect this, uh, by odor probably, uh, they come in and start rolling it up into little balls, cutting because it's, it's much too big for them. Let me show you a picture. Of, come back. This is a dung beetle, and what he's done, there's a big pad, a big animal pad nearby, and he's cut off with his cutting claws uh, this big ball, and that's what he's going to present to a female. So a whole lot of dung beetles come in, they make these balls, then in, in the species I'm talking about, they put it on their back and sort of parade around with it. Meanwhile, the females are around the outside, and they're watching all this go on, and what males do they choose? Ones with the biggest balls. <laughs> so she, she, wants, she wants resources and that's her, her resource. Now the most extreme case of this is in praying mantises. So praying mantises are beautiful animals, as you may know, here's, here's one of them. And, but they're very solitary. They have to actually catch insects. They, they sit on the ends of branches and with these claws and they wait for an insect to fly by and then they grab it and, and eat it. It's not, an easy, it's not an easy way to make your living. So they're poised, they're very quiet, and they want to capture me. They have just a few milliseconds, something buzzing by. Now a male comes up and wants to mate with this female, but she's ready to eat. So he's got the problem of approaching her and not getting eaten. And in evolution, they sometimes get eaten and that has led to a very interesting uh, form of, of reproductive strategy that what you see is <coughs> that the male will come on and you can see that that's the male on top and look how much smaller he is than the female. Many species the male is bigger but he's smaller 
And that's, that's a sign that the males are not fighting with each other. You'll see later that if the male is bigger, that means they're almost always means they're fighting. For but she's big because he only has to make sperm, she has to make eggs. Notice he has his head still on, she has her head on. That's the way it starts, and you think that something normal is going to take place. But in actual fact, she reaches around, grabs him, she's bigger and stronger than him, pulls him off, and starts eating his head. And what then happens is she allows him to go back, but now you can see she's still got her head. There's no head there. And the way the insect nervous system is put out, the, all the circuits to coordinate the copulation are down here. <laughs> and what the head actually does is inhibit that. You know, unless it goes and says, well, most situations, no, this isn't right to start copulating, but only in the very special situation where it's a female, when she eats off his head, that releases those circuits from inhibition, and he copulates her to completion. Now, and then she can, when he's done, she can eat the rest of him. Now, what's really interesting is that he doesn't object. He doesn't try to get away. What's going on? He, the, the, the key thing is that this is a sparse species. How many of you have seen a praying mantis? How many of you have seen a lot of praying mantises? Yeah, one person. You must study them or something. <laughs> they're, not hard, they're not easy to find. There's not many of them. So if a male is lucky enough to find a female and get in this situation, man, he's in heaven. And it's unlikely if he leaves her, he's going to find another one. That's just an unlikely event. So how does he maximize his reproduction? Well, in my one chance, I've got to have that female produce as many eggs with my genes in it. So he wants her to produce a lot of big, very healthy eggs. And so his body is the food for her, including a lot of protein, so that she can make a whole lot of eggs. And evolution, it's worked out that males who sacrifice their bodies uh, to this have more offspring than males who don't. So you see the evolution from him being prey just because he's prey to it being an actual part of the whole sexual situation. So the next time someone tells you that evolution is the survival of the fittest, what are you going to tell them? Fitness has n uh, survival has nothing to do with the price of cheese. <laughs> that, th that's only one of the ways. Okay. Now, the next strategy of females, so the first is to get resources. The second strategy is for females to try to find the male with the best genes and so that she, uh, her offspring, are, have good genes and are very successful. So uh, there's a whole lot of aspects to this, and one is she has to be able to control which male is fertilizing her genes. So the more separated the male and the female are, when you spew out into the ocean eggs and sperms, there's no control whatsoever. The closer that you come, uh, the, the male and the female come to each other, the more control that the female has. And one of the interesting ways of looking at this is of internal fertilization, as in humans. Uh, it, is a, it is, among other things, a strategy for female uh, control. So internal fertilization and internal growth of the, of the fetus has a lot of advantages. It protects the fetus. The fetus allows the mother to provide nutrition and waste removal continuously, et cetera. But there are also this aspect of the female control strategy. Uh, generally, if a female won't allow a mating, it doesn't happen. If the female doesn't allow it, then rape has to happen. We'll talk about uh, rape later. In humans, as you know, females have a vulva, and that's the Latin word for valve. She can open it, she can close it, and that's the whole idea. So if the female wants to mate, she gets excited and she lubricates. And the purpose of the lubrication is to ease penetration and ease the sexual act. Behavioral, she's also, aside from lubricating, she's receptive, she assumes a proper posture, and everything goes uh, just fine. But if these things, if she doesn't want to do it and these things don't happen, there's no lubrication, there's no assumption of the proper posture, which is necessary for internal fertilization, uh, then uh, it's very hard uh, for the male to intermit. And probably sexual intercourse won't happen. <clears throat> in a real rape, say among humans, the, va the vagina does not lubricate, and that's why there's so much uh, 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 lacerating and, and tearing of the vaginal walls. That's why it's so dangerous, because it's part of the 
the human female strategy to control what males inseminate her is to not lubricate, but if she's forced, uh, there can be a lot of damage done to her. So how does a female know which male has the best genes, which male to allow to inseminate her? <coughs> she has to either watch a competition or, or see the male in some way or know the outcome of some competition that she doesn't see by, say, detecting a male's uh, position in a status uh, hierarchy. <coughs> so in some birds, uh, like flamingos, there's a beautiful movie of flamingos doing this, which I don't have time to show. Uh, there can be a hundred or so males can gather together and start dancing. It's what's called a lek, and many of you may have heard of it or seen on National Geographic movies. The males dance back and forth, back and forth. They show their coordination. They show how perfect their feathers are. They show their stamina because they're, they're doing this for quite a long time. And again, the females stand around on the outside and try to notice a male who's a good dancer, a good, long, strong, well-coordinated dancer, and then she chooses him and goes off and mates. And by choosing these males that are not, you know, not creaking around, <laughs> uh, uh, she presumes that she's getting a male with, a good <coughs> with good genes. Another way that, uh, that um, the females get to choose a good male is by choosing males who have, by, in species where males fight as part of male strategy, then the females choose the winners. That males may fight and, and you set up a dominance hierarchy, but there's nothing says that the female has to choose the top dog. Maybe she wants to choose a middle dog or a bottom dog. But in general in species, females choose the top dog. They, they, they know the result of, for a variety of ways, the dominance fights, and the female then chooses uh, the top dog. And in the male fights, the, the winner gets gets the female or maybe gets a whole harem of females, and the loser may get absolutely <coughs> nothing. Well, the females are very happy to join uh, the winner's harem. Why is that? Because once that starts in a species, that means that male has some genes which allow him to win these fights. He's, he's big, he's strong, he's vicious, he has sharp teeth, he's a violent character, and therefore he is successful in these battles, and the female wants her young to also wants being in this evolutionary sense of if she does that, she passes on her genes. The female wants her offspring to have these characteristics of being able to win a fight, i.e. of being very violent. So she will choose the most violent male, the winner of these battles, to father her children because then, they, then the odds are that they will also become these big, strong, violent uh, males. <coughs> and so what happens in this case is in evolution, males may start fighting, and once the females select the, the fighters, then both male and female reproductive strategy colludes in increasing the violence a little bit in every generation. And so it's very interesting that male and female violence colluding in male-on-male -male violence. Okay, what else does evolution do? Well, if the males are fighting each other and reproductive success depends on winning these fights, then males will tend to get larger. And uh, you get a, a large male, humans, chimpanzees, the male's larger than the female, and that helps them in the fights. But it also opens up a second strategy for reproductive success. We, oh, three, four, we have time. A second strategy for reproductive success, and that is that the male is now bigger than the female, and he can start coercing the female. So, he may not have to fight the males, he can just coerce, fight with, and coerce uh, this uh, smaller female. And then guess what happens? If that gets into a species, that the males start coercing the females, what is, a, what is an evolutionarily wise female to do? She chooses a male who is most successful at coercing females because, again, her children will then inherit those genes which will allow them to successfully coerce females and get more reproduction and have more offspring. So again we see that not only are male and female reproductive strategies cooperating in an increase in male-on-male -male violence, they also cooperate in an increasing male-on-female violence. 
It's really quite an interesting uh, way of looking at things and explains, starts to explain some of this violence that we see in human interactions. <coughs> now, the great, we belong to the great ape uh, line of evolution, and it seems that our line of evolution seems to specialize in male and female violence. And consider rape. So, a lot of s political correctness about use of the word rape, but I'm going to do it in the straight biological sense, as rape is the coercion of an unwilling female into intercourse. Outside of mammals, there are only a very few species where rape occurs. Scorpion flies are one of the best known examples. Normal sex occurs when a male offers a female a dead insect or other food mass. She's getting resources from him. After she accepts, she allows copulation to proceed, um, uh, and it goes smoothly. Sometimes, however, sex happens in quite a different way. A male without an offering can ambush the female, and she clearly is trying to escape, and the whole time he's got genital claspers to try to grab onto her, and she's uh, trying to get away and, and, and push him away, fly away. And in your reading, there's a description of, of this rape of scorpion flies, so I don't have to go further with it. Invertebrates, rapes occur in several species of ducks, and in mammals, there are only three species where rape is routine. Elephant seals, orangutans, and humans. Rape occurs occasionally in three other mammal species, chimpanzees, howler mon monkeys, and gorillas when they're captive. It has not been observed in the wild. So this is really quite striking. So of the six species, ma uh, mammalian species, in which rape has been observed, five of those are, are uh, the great a are, are apes. I'm sorry, one is a monkey. Uh, <coughs> the six species of primates where it's been observed, uh, uh, four are great apes like us. So those statistics are way out of the range uh, of chance. There is something special about ape evolution that has led to this emphasis on a violent relationship between males and females. And most likely, it is the extreme unavailability of eggs. So it's an extremely rare, in, in, in the great apes, it's extremely rare to find a female who has an egg ready to be fertilized. Why? Well, first, primates take many years to become sexually uh, mature. In chimps and humans, it's around 12 to 13 years before a female uh, can ovulate an egg. So and then primate mothers have these long gestation periods, eight months in chimps, nine months in humans. And so just counting gestation and the recovery from childbirth, females can have at most one young a year, which means one egg available for fertilization in a whole year. But then the females lactate, and you probably know about uh, lactational amenorrhea, that when a female is, is lactating and the baby is sucking on, on the nipple, uh, Hormones are released, and the female does not uh, lactate, does not ovulate again. And the average for chimpanzees is about another four years in which the female uh, feeds, uh, breastfeeds uh, the infant, and so she doesn't come into fertility again. And then they can sometimes stay with their young uh, an, an even longer time. So the average birth interval for chimpanzees is five and a half years. That means for any female, there's one egg every five and a half years ready to be fertilized. Uh, that's Jane Goodall's number. A Japanese group says it's six years. For orangutans, it's eight years. And gorilla females have a baby about once every 10 years. So there's an extreme dearth of eggs uh, to get fertilized. So you have a chimp community. There's, say, 40, 45 to 55 individuals, something like that. Maybe 10 or 12, this is a big community, 10 or 12 sexually mature males, about the same number of females, um, uh, non-mature males and females. And of those then, given the very long period, there's probably going to be one or two females in that whole year who are going to be fertile and in estrus and ready <coughs> to get fertilized. So these males spend the whole year, in terms of their reproductive evolution, spend the whole year setting themselves up 
to have that one, to inseminate that one egg that's available in that whole year. You can imagine there's going to be a huge amount of competition, a huge amount of violence uh, among the males. And as we've seen, that male-male violence then spills over into male-female violence. <coughs> Within this group, uh, we, we, we belong to an order called uh, primates, uh, as you know, and within this group, monkeys are fairly distant relatives, but the rest of the great apes are, the, the great apes are fairly close, and you can see there's a lot of similarities. Um, these are some jokes about the <laughs> singles bar. <laughs> Even in biology, they, they have some sense of humor still left. <laughs> Now, this is another professor at Yale, <laughs> and uh, I always ask students, you know, you have too many advisees, so I ask them, you know, wouldn't you rather go to this guy? And, you know, he looks very fatherly and, and kind and everything. <laughs> well, that's an orangutan, and of the, of the great apes, it's as far <gasps> distant from humans as uh, the, the most distant species, and yet looks pretty much, you know, you can empathize with that uh, as, as almost a human being. It doesn't take a lot of evolution to go between these two. There are five species of great apes. Oh, that's a young guy. <laughs> this, is 15, this is a time scale. About 15 million years ago, there was one line of evolution coming up from a long time ago, and the first event was that orangutan split off the tree, that the tree split and one branch became orangutans. Then about 10 million years ago, another, there was another split and gorillas went off, a, a group went off and became gorillas. Then about 6 million years ago, another group came off and they evolved into humans. The most recent split is about uh, 2 million years ago and gave two species, very similar species, chimpanzees and bonobos. The farther distant the split is, the more there's been time to evolve differently. So an orangutan, who has that nice guy, is very distant from uh, the other species. <coughs> so that's, that's our family tree. And the difference, this, this is a fairly recent split here, and the genetic difference between these three species, between any pair of those three species, is about one and a half percent. We, if you draw out the DNA sequence for, uh, for a chimpanzee and a human and look at the base pairs, and out of every 198 uh, or 99 will be identical and one or two will be different. So we're extremely uh, similar uh, genetically. Uh, <clears throat> now, what does this difference mean, one and a half, two percent? We don't have the foggiest idea of what it means. Obviously, you know, you can look at a chimpanzee and say, hey, it ain't human and their behavior is different, and they can't speak, and all kinds of things. But genetically, there's not that big uh, of, of a difference. So I wouldn't draw any particular conclusions from the genetics yet. We're, this is a rapidly evolving field, and we're going to learn an awful lot very quickly, and uh, one doesn't know what the conclusions are going to turn out to be. One thing which may be solid is that if you look between a man, you know, Females have two X chromosomes, and males have an X and a Y chromosome. So you can ask, well, what is the genetic distance between a human male and a human female? And guess what? One and a half percent. <laughs> so whatever you think of the difference, uh, genetic distance of those species, you pretty much, at this current stage of our knowledge, have to think the same as the genetic difference between a human male and a human female. So that's, that's grist for your thinking. Um, <coughs> each of the great ape species has evolved a different social system to organize reproduction. And all but one have an awful lot of violence associated with it. <coughs> Orangutans are the least social of apes. Uh, the males and the females generally uh, stay apart, and the mother and the child are the only stable <coughs> social unit. The, the offspring stay with the mother until adolescence, very much like the chimpanzee story and, and, and like the human story. It's about 10 years before the young separates. And for most of the eight years between births, the mother has no interest in, in males at all, no interest in sex at all. She doesn't really 
come very close to them. There are two kinds of orangutan males. There's a large one and a small one. The big males are about 200 pounds. Uh, the females and the small males are less than half that size, about 90 pounds. Uh, there's a sm the small male develops normally up to adolescence and then just stops developing further. Doesn't develop the characteristics of, of, of the full male. Doesn't grow a beard, uh, crests uh, of the hair, throat pouches, and etc. They remain looking like adolescents. But they're completely fertile and have a normal complement of testosterone. They're sexually totally capable. And they can stay as this, in this adolescent stage for up to 18 years, maybe longer, but that's the most that anyone has observed them. And they probably don't grow into a big male until the dominant male in the region ha has died or is too weak uh, to defend himself. <clears throat> so the females uh, always want to, when they have a choice, they always want to mate with the big males, because the big males are more successful. And it's the old story that females mate with males of a type that are already successful, because that is good for the genes that her children get. In the mating, uh, between a, a, a female and a big male, sex is very relaxed. Uh, it has, takes on a languorous quality and a, an erotic quality. There's not a great rush. Matings can begin with oral or manual manipulation of the partner's genitalia, and it can be initiated by either the male or by the female. And when they finally do engage in intercourse, um, they do it often face-to-face, -face, missionary style, and it takes for about, a, about as long as it takes humans, uh, an average of 11 minutes and up to a half an hour, just in case you, you want to compare. Uh, now these big males are ponderous. They can't move fast. Whereas the females are lithe and they can, they can, they can go uh, pretty fast. So you know the female is choosing the male because if you didn't want him, <laughs> she could be gone. There's no way that he could catch her. But what about the small males? They, uh, they are not attractive to females, but they have, only, they have one advantage. They're small and they're fast and they can run fast and they can catch females. So that's what mother evolution has, has done. They try to catch and rape the females. <clears throat> and the females are usually, as I said, alone with their young. And if they're found by a single, by one of these small males, they're chased and, and sometimes they get caught. And then the females show fear and they struggle to escape, and the males sometimes strike them or bite them, and the females scream, and the young de they're, they're dependent, they're, they're the young scream. Uh, the females bite back, they hit, they pull the hair of the males uh, while the copulation is going on. And that lasts as, uh, not more than 10, ten minutes. <clears throat> so how common is this? Uh, different orangutans are very hard to see. They live in a part of, of Borneo that's hard to get to. And they're, they're very hard to see. But so there's different studies coming to different conclusions. Uh, one ethologist uh, found that about a third, one third of ora uh, orang mutations involve some degree of forcing of the female by the male. Japanese observers reported that 88% of the copulations were rapes and that these were of the severe kind. A Dutch observer judged half the copulations to be rape. So these are not rare events, they're the standard part of the orangutan uh, sexual uh, strategy. There's a lot of examples where uh, orangs are close enough to humans that apparently a lot of those same sexual signals uh, are passing. Uh, <clears throat> a woman primatologist who, who ran uh, primatology research in, in, in Borneo uh, <clears throat> talked about an orang who had lived with humans for a lot of his life, so he was very acculturated to humans. And one day, apparently, he raped one of the female cooks, the orangutan, the male orang, raped one of the human female cooks at the camp. And apparently, it was a complete rape with penetration uh, and everything. And as you know, uh, rape is a big, embarrass a big embarrassment for the female as well as the male. But in this case, and this is in Indonesia, uh, the husband, very unusually, took it quite easily. The husband said that since the rapist was not human, the rape should not provoke a shame or rage. He said, why should my wife, or be con uh, my wife or I be concerned? It wasn't a man. So <laughs> there's all kinds of stories that uh, 
I don't have time to tell you <laughs> about this. Uh. Okay, now why doesn't evolution uh, just keep the males and females together? Probably food density. Because food is hard to get and, and individuals have to forage alone to find enough food. If they forage in pairs, what they found would not be enough for two of them. <coughs> now gorillas live in a region uh, and have an ecology that they have more food available to them. So they live in somewhat larger groups and in gorillas um, the females stick close to the male. Each male, a uh, big silverback male can have a harem of say three to four uh, females. In these harem things they spend most of their time, just the, the few of them together. They're quiet, they're relaxed, uh, they're affectionate with each other. The, the, the troop is stable uh, with the, the one silverback, the three or four females and whatever young uh, they have. Very little aggressiveness of between the males and the females, or female to female, just hardly happens. But, as I said before, if one male is controlling three to four females, that means there's two to three males that don't have any mates whatsoever. And what is evolution going to do with those bachelor males? Again, it ain't nice. The males, so they, the gorillas travel through the jungle, resting some, eating some. They eat fruits, they eat roots, they eat shoots. These bachelor males follow the troop on the uphill side and just wait until the silverback is not watching. Then they charge down, they make, can make a fair amount of noise, so often the silverback notices and goes over and beats the hell out of the guy, and he retreats again. But every so often he's successful. He, the, the male is with another female or off, not, you know, never very far away, but a little away. He goes down, what does he do? He charges downhill, so he gets up a lot of speed, he charges right at a female with a young. He grabs the young, immediately uh, smashes it on the ground and kills it. Runs away. Doesn't try to do anything more. Just kills the young of the female. Now what does the female do? The females are, these are very smart. They're, they're great apes, so they're very smart. They recognize each other's individuals. They have long memories. So you would expect that this female would remember this male the rest of her life and fear him, uh, hate him, avoid him. In fact, the opposite happens. What happens is the female, within a few days, generally leaves the silverback that was supposed to be guarding her and goes with the single male, and they go off and have a consort ship. What the message that the male is delivering to the female is, look, you've put a huge investment into this infant, and now it's wasted. That guy can't protect you. you know, he has too many females, he's too old, he's too big and slow, he can't protect you. I can, you, you, can get, you can stay with him, get pregnant again, and I'm going to come down and kill your next baby too. So if you want to reproduce, you come off with me. Of course, none of this is verbal. This is an evolutionary <laughs> story. You, I, hope, I hope you understand that you know, they're not mentating the stuff that, I, that I'm saying. Uh, and so what you notice is in a few days, this female leaves and goes with the male that has just killed her young and, and starts reproducing with that one. That may be stable and last a long time, or another male may come by and in a few months uh, separate him, separate them. So again, these are not isolated incidents. Uh, Diane Fossey uh, had data on about 50 infants. 38% of them died uh, before they were three, and 37% of those were from infanticide. About one infant in seven dies from infanticide. And each of the female gorillas she studied had at least one infant that was killed uh, by infanticide. So in the gorillas, the females are trapped in this vortex of male-initiated violence. At any moment, a male may come crashing through the forest and, and, and kill her young. And the best way for her to prevent this is to go off with that male. She needs protection. She leads, lives in a world of baby killers, and she needs protection from them. Chimpanzees, so we're going down the list of species and we won't get time to finish, but chimpanzees have yet another solution uh, to this primate reproductive problem of very, very scarce eggs. Unlike or orangs and gorillas, the males are not solitary, but related males spend their lifetime together as a community. <coughs> Chimps live in groups of about 40 individuals. 
uh, with a dozen or so uh, adult males and a similar number of adult uh, females. As with the orangutans, uh, the chimp females spend most of their time alone with their young, and they're not separated from their young until the young are, are several years old, really into adolescence. And so first they hold them, they're not physically separated for several years, and then for several years they're not out of sight, and then for several more years they're not out of voice contact. So it's really very, very tight bonding between mother and, 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 and children. <coughs> the males defend a rather large territory, uh, numbers of square kilometers, in which they range and in which the, the females range. And the males spend their time searching for food, patrolling uh, the borders of the territory, and they're often with other males. This patrolling is, often, is, is, a, is, a, is a bunch of males together. <coughs> and they go around checking on the females to see which ones have come into estrus, or if any have come into estrus. As I mentioned, the females come into estrus only about once every six years uh, after their last young was born. They have a 35-day cycle, very similar to humans, and are sexually receptive for about 15 of these days in each of their monthly cycles. Her fertility increases during these 15 days, and she's most fertile the last two or three days of this receptive period. The females do an interesting thing. Have you ever been to a zoo and looked at chimpanzee females? What do you see? Big red rump. If they're, if they're fertile, it looks rather disgusting to humans. And I've been looking for a picture of it, and amazingly, it's such a striking thing, I cannot find a, a really good picture of this. But you go to a zoo, it's very, very obvious. They, they're uh, anal, they call anogenital swelling. <coughs> they advertise their estrus. Oppositely to humans, humans keep their estrus secret. Neither the male nor the female knows whether they're an estrus. Chimpanzees advertise, everybody knows. Now why did they do that? Well, what happens is when a female comes into estrus, the males have been waiting all year for this, the males congregate together. And what do the males start doing? Competing for the female. They're fighting. The dominant male arrives. And clear who's dominant. So the females advertise as a way of inciting male violence. That they want to be able to choose the dominant male, the ones that are in great fighting form. So they say, hey, I'm in estrus. All you guys come and fight, and I'm going to sit there and, and, and choose uh, the, the, the best of you, which in this case means the most violent of you. <coughs> but unfortunately, in this situation, all these males are not only fighting with each other, but they're trying to get at the females. So the females are, are herded about. They have to run around uh, to escape the, the, and the, cl the clashes with the males. They regularly receive quite a lot of, of, of wounds. When they're chased, or they try to climb up trees to escape this. Sometimes they, they fall out of trees. Uh, and uh, they have their young with them, and the young sometimes cling to them. And then if they f the, the mothers fall, the kids fall. It's a very, very dangerous, uh, unpleasant time. And the, 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 uh, the violence is so great that when a male approaches a female, she doesn't know whether he's coming to be, uh, you know, to try to mate with her or to be violent toward her. Because you'll read in the reading how the males have a long history of being violent to the females. It's a way of cowing them so that, that when they're in this uh, melee, when they're estrus, and the male approaches them, they don't resist. If they do try to resist, he does a lot of violence on them. So the male has to, when a male comes and wants to mate with the female, he has to signal to her, don't run away. I'm not going to try to uh, beat you up. And he has, uh, this is, sorry, these orangutans, gorilla, chimpanzee with uh, her young. Uh, this is the, uh, this male is inspecting the female that not only is a red rump, but there's, there's odors, chemicals, and he's trying to see what, what the status of her, her cycle is. Uh, and this is a male displaying, letting a female know uh, that, that this is a sexual uh, engagement. And humans have been known to do the same thing. This is a picture from Borneo, the same sort of advertising with pretty much the same message. And here's an incredible <laughs> photograph. <laughs> And I said, I don't know, should I leave that on the board for you? <laughs> <laughs> I get in trouble leaving things like that on the up, up, up for too long. Um, 
Okay, now, <clears throat> so in this great melee, this great violent melee, there's all the males there trying to get at this female. Um, if a male does, if let's say the alpha male is all fighting with someone else and the female's alone for a minute, the male, uh, any male that's around, rushes in. But he's not going to have a lot of time before the other males notice what's going on and rush in to, to separate them because they're all competing for, to inseminate uh, that egg. So the males have a very short time in which to complete the copulation. And ejaculation occurs after an average of 15 seconds with only 8.8 .8 pelvic thrusts. I think those are very important numbers you, you should know. <coughs> but the females make up in quantity what they don't get in quality. They appear, and there's a story behind this, but they appear to be quite promiscuous in their sex partners. In the community followed by Jane Goodall, in each estrus cycle, each female had at least one bout of intercourse with every male. So all the males are getting some chance at having intercourse. They average six encounters a day. Don't get excited, it's still only a minute and a half <laughs> at their rate. And in each monthly sexual cycle, they have about 100 or so bouts of intercourse. So it, there's a lot of sexuality. Do females have organ orgasms? Not known. There's debates about it, but not known. All right, I guess um, um, our time is running out. Uh, we will continue on Thursday, and I'll set up sections in between. And uh, any questions? Okay, I stay after every lecture for as long as necessary if people want to come down and ask questions.